Hello once again everybody and welcome to part 8 of our read aloud of the stupendous dodgeball fiasco by Janice Repka. When we left off, boy things are getting interesting. Philip is suing not just the school but the city and BB and Coach Tyson, the dodgeball factory. Uncle Felix got fired. BB was eliminated by Philip in a dodgeball game. He found out more about the history of his mom dropping the cheerleaders in the great stupendous dodgeball fiasco, the greatest dodgeball fiasco in Hardingtown history. His lawsuit is moving forward. Uh, he's being almost borderline threatened by the administration of his school to drop the lawsuit. And Principal Bellow even said things could get bad for the boy. And Aunt Viola thankfully stood up for Philip. Oh my goodness, just so much stuff going on. And so when we, right when we left off, Sam was talking about how some of the dodgeball company lawyers had been poking around asking questions about Philip. And he offered Philip an out saying, look, if you want to drop the lawsuit, I understand. Philip said, no way. I'm going to keep going. The Windy Van Hooten Circus once put up posters announcing that a genuine unicorn would be performing in their show. One morning, the animal arrived in a large wooden crate. Philip, expecting a one-horned horse, was disappointed to find a one-horned goat. His mom explained that the word unicorn simply means one horn, so the circus wasn't really lying when it said they had a genuine unicorn. Philip wasn't really lying to Sam when he told him he wasn't afraid to continue the lawsuit. At the time, he hadn't been scared. But now it was Monday, he was at school, maybe Tyson was coming down the hall. Philip slammed his locker shut so he could hurry off, but the sleeve of his shirt got caught in the door. Bibi was heading straight for him. He twisted and pulled to yank the cloth free, but it was too late. He was trapped. Philip hid his stuck arm behind his back and tried to look casual. I need to talk to you. B.B. said. She was so close he could smell her mint toothpaste. Somewhere private. No, said Philip, discreetly trying to tug his sleeve free. Here's fine. B.B. shot him a funny look. The hallway crowds had thinned and the remaining kids were heading toward their classrooms. Okay, fine, she said. It's about your lawsuit. I wanted you to know how I feel about it. Philip glanced around uncomfortably. She was going to clobber him then and there. He didn't need the whole school to see it. On the other hand, she wasn't likely to beat him to death in front of witnesses. I've never seen my dad so angry. And Vice Principal Race, too. All because of some nobody kid. It was so, so, and BB raised her arm and Philip readied himself for the blow. So cool, she said. I mean, here I am thinking you're completely spineless because you don't like to play dodgeball. Then you pick a fight with the whole school? With the whole town? She flipped a strand of hair out of her eyes and tucked it behind her ear. There's hope for you yet, Stanislaw. Philip's mouth was still hanging open as he watched her zip off to class. Suddenly a hand grabbed his free shoulder. Philip, jeez, where have you been? It was Sean, breathing heavily like he'd been running. There's something I need to tell you. What is it? asked Philip, still half dazed from his encounter with Bibi. You gotta swear not to let anyone know I told you. Okay, said Philip. Swear it, demanded Sean. I swear, said Philip, crossing his heart with his free hand. A bunch of kids were talking. Their parents work at the dodgeball factory. The next dodgeball game, they're going to try and put you out of commission. How many kids? Philip asked. More than you can handle, said Sean. If you want my advice, the only way you're not going to get hurt in gym class is if you make sure you get hurt before gym class. Catch my drift? Philip caught it. He was suggesting Philip fake an injury to get out of gym class. Philip decided he would take Sean's advice. He'd bandage a finger, and when Coach asked him what had happened, he would say he slammed his locker door on himself. It wouldn't be a complete lie. Thanks, Sean, Philip said. He watched as Sean and the other kids scurried off to class, leaving him all by himself. Strangely, for the first time since he arrived in Hardingtown, he didn't feel completely alone. Sean was on his side. Even more amazing, B.B. Tyson had chosen not to beat him to death. Philip felt like things might finally be starting to go his way, until he remembered his sleeve was still stuck in his locker. After an hour and a half of hanging upside down, even the best acrobat will get dizzy and take a break. Just thinking about all the dodgeballs that had whizzed his way since his first dodgeball game had made Philip dizzy. Hadn't he earned a break too? Coach scarcely cared when Philip showed his bandaged finger and asked to sit out. Philip had feared he would have to go to the nurse's office and get a note. Instead, Coach treated him like an insect not even worth swatting. Philip climbed to the top of the bleachers like he was ascending a throne. He would be immune to the chaos below. 
but as soon as he was there and felt the cold, hard wood beneath him, he wondered if he had done the right thing. The kids picked teams and went to their respective sides. A couple of them glanced up at Philip. He hoped they understood. Once he'd won the injunction, they'd be safe too. Until then, he just had to save himself, especially with a whole gang after him. Coach put the first ball on the line, then the second and the third. With each ball, Philip felt his heart beating harder like the quickening pace of a drum. Coach looked up at Philip. It felt as if he knew Philip's thoughts. BB, Coach yelled. Grab up. The gym was so silent you could hear the sound of her sneakers squeaking across the floor. Coach took the ball and added it to the line. Let the game begin, he said and blew his whistle. A girl with asthma was the first to go, felled by a boy with a straight aim and a crooked nose. Others started getting picked off. With four dodgeballs in play, some of the kids were getting hit by more than one ball at once. The smell of dirty socks was quickly overpowered by the stench of drenched underarms. Bibi and a tall, skinny kid, both armed with balls, squared off in a showdown. Philip recognized the kid. His mom worked at the dodgeball factory. Why was he going after Bibi? A rat, the big kid said. Here's a piece of cheese for you. He flung the dodgeball like a grenade, but Bibi deflected it with the ball in her hands. She slammed hers straight at the kid, tripping his right leg. You're out, Coach yelled. Two more kids whose parents worked at the factory raced over to get a piece of Bibi. She dodged the first ball with ease, but the second nearly got her. Bring it on, she shouted at the other team, and they did. One against one, two against one, three against one. Each time she dodged their rounds and returned fire, but it only provided them more ammunition. Finally, it was four against one. They stood barely behind their line, a 12-year-old with a chip on his shoulder and a long scar across his chin, his human tank friend, a girl with thick arm muscles and stringy hair, and the boy with the crooked nose. They teasingly tossed their balls in the air, knowing that they had her. Not even B.B. Tyson could handle a four-ball assault. She was tired, weakened, needing to rest. B.B. turned to retreat, but bumped into a kid hiding behind her. They crashed to the ground. The kid crawled backward in a crab walk. B.B. turned and looked across the line, chin up, chest out, waiting to feel the first strike. Wait! Philip yelled. He couldn't bear to see B.B. get pummeled. He had to do something. Stop the game! He raced down the bleachers and over to coach. A shrill whistle froze the dodgeballers in place and gave B.B. a temporary reprieve. What do you think you're doing? Coach asked. Philip ripped the bandage from his finger. It's not really hurt. It was a lie. You're the strangest kid I've ever met, said Coach. Am I in the game? You're in, he said. B.B. was still draped like a rug on the floor with the four gorillas ready to pounce. Philip raced over. You okay? he asked. She nodded, but the look in her eyes said they were still in trouble. She got up and stood next to Philip. Coach's whistle revived the action. Oh, isn't that cute, said the girl with thick arm muscles. B.B.'s got a boyfriend, she teased. Bye-bye, boyfriend. She pitched the ball hard at Philip's head, but he jumped up and caught it. Immediately, the crooked nose boy lobbed another ball at him. It headed straight for Philip's stomach. He threw the first ball up in the air and caught the second ball. When the first ball began to come back down, he instinctively started juggling the two. He kept them high in the air, just like he'd been taught. A trickle of sweat ran down Philip's forehead as he concentrated. Look out! screamed B.B. as she dove in front of him and caught the third ball fired by the human tank. Thanks, said Philip, still juggling. Toss it here! She tossed the third ball at him and it was swallowed into the juggling mass. Chip and Scar Boy held the fourth ball. He slammed it toward B.B.'s torso while she was watching Philip. She turned to grab it as it was about to pelt her in the stomach. The force of the ball knocked her back and she stumbled before getting her footing. But she hoisted the fourth ball triumphantly in the air. Her teammates began cheering wildly before Coach's whistle pierced the air. That's enough of that juggling nonsense. Get those balls back into play. There's no rule against juggling in dodgeball, said Sean. Yeah, that's right, another kid agreed. You go, cool slaw. Coach blew his whistle, but Philip did not stop. Coach's face began to turn grayish blue. Still, the whistle could not be heard above the cheers. After Philip got more height on the dodgeballs, he motioned for Bibi to toss in the last one. She glanced at her father's angry face, then back at Philip. She tossed the ball to Philip and grinned. He didn't stop juggling until the bell rang. During his walk to the courthouse after school, Philip kept replaying the scene in his mind. It was like he had died and gone to dodgeball heaven. That had to be the only explanation for what had occurred. 
When he got to the courthouse, Aunt Viola told him that his new glasses were ready and they would be picking them up that night. Philip went straight to the snack bar to tell Sam what had happened. Bibi's really changed, Sam. I don't think she's going to bully me again, and I don't want to sue her anymore. Suing the dodgeball factory in the school is enough. I want to drop Bibi from the lawsuit. But Sam didn't agree. It's not that simple, he said. Why not? Why can't I drop Bibi from the lawsuit? If you drop the assault charge against BB now, another bully will figure he can hit another kid and not have to worry. If you let one bully get away with something, you're letting all bullies get away with it. Philip could see his mother inside the gymnasium on the day of the regional high school championship game, her hedgehog-colored cheerleading ribbons drooping in limp ponytails. He pictured her trying to block out the shouts and jeers of the accusing crowd and then fleeing in defeat. Sam was right. The lawsuit wasn't just about him and Bibi. It was about kids everywhere standing up for themselves. He had to keep going, even against Bibi. I understand, said Philip. I'm glad, said Sam, because our hearing is set for Monday morning. Philip dropped his root beer. The foaming brew splashed across the table and dripped onto the floor. Because they had asked the court for an injunction, the judge wanted to hear the case right away. Sam explained a bunch of other legal stuff, too. As Philip grabbed napkins and mopped up the mess, all he could think was that the hearing would be here in no time. If he lost the case in court, the dodgeball bullies would be waiting for him and his friends. All his hard work would have been for nothing. The kids on the bleachers, Sam, Aunt Viola, Uncle Felix, even somehow his mom, he would let them all down. He'd be a loser. The official laughing stock of the unofficial dodgeball capital of the world. Pink Lemonade was created accidentally by a circus vendor who used a bucket of water that another performer had washed her red tights in. Whenever someone is being careless because they're rushing, circus performers say they're making Pink Lemonade. The morning of his hearing, Philip did not want to make Pink Lemonade. He took his time getting ready, loading his briefcase with legal books and papers. It was really a suitcase from the attic that looked like a briefcase but was bigger. Philip couldn't understand why lawyers paid extra to buy smaller bags. He wore black pants and a white button-down shirt. A too-long necktie, which he had borrowed from Uncle Felix, was knotted clumsily around his thin neck. Since he didn't own any dress shoes, he wore sneakers. Philip took so long getting ready, Aunt Viola left without him, and Uncle Felix had to drive him to the courthouse. Uncle Felix's lime-green Volkswagen Beetle made a putt-putt sound as they chugged down the street. After the car passed the dodgeball factory, it began to sputter, and in less than a block, the engine stalled. There must be a leak in my gas tank. Uncle Felix said. Don't worry, there's a gas station ahead and it's downhill from here. Oh no, thought Philip, I can't be late, not today. Uncle Felix put the car in neutral. Philip got out and pushed. He had to lean his shoulder into it to get the car rolling while Uncle Felix steered it into Friendly's gas and go. A sign advertised the special of the month for November was a free dodgeball poster with each oil change. An old man and woman in matching dirty blue overalls shuffled over. Philip had seen them before, snuggling together on the bench outside of the shop waiting for customers. The woman washed the windshield while the old man reached for the gas nozzle. Hey, Felix, the old man said. Coasting again, huh? He flipped a switch and the meter on the gas pump began to run. The gas fumes made Philip's nose tingle like he was going to sneeze. He hopped back into the passenger seat. You want I should fill out a credit card slip or you pay in cash? Asked the old man. Uncle Felix squeezed forward and reached for his back pocket. I must have left my wallet in my other pants. Again? The old man asked. Philip reached into the glove box and grabbed a white handkerchief. He unfolded it and gave Uncle Felix a crisp $20 bill. Where'd this come from? Uncle Felix asked. Aunt Viola hid it there just in case because you're always forgetting to put gas in the car. Now can we hurry? I've really got to get to court. Don't forget! Yelled the old man as they put putted away. Next month, we give out a free ticket for the annual Dodgeball World Series and barbecue with every tune-up. Uncle Felix was already late for his new job at the airport, so he dropped off Philip at the front steps of the courthouse. Philip was strangely relieved they had run out of gas. After that, what else could go wrong? Inside the courthouse, he got in line for the metal detector, but this time it felt different. Good morning, Philip, Aunt Viola said. Hello, Aunt Viola, Philip replied. He placed his lucky marble and a paperclip chain into the plastic change box. You'll have to go through this time, she said, since you'll be going into a courtroom. Philip dropped his briefcase onto the conveyor belt and walked through the metal detector. It did not make a sound. You're supposed to meet Sam in courtroom number two, 
she told him. I'll be up to watch when this rush is over. Past the security area, Philip noticed that the courthouse lobby looked especially crowded. Excuse me, sorry, pardon me, he said, trying to get through. Hey, Philip, over here, he heard a familiar voice yell. It was Sean O'Malley. Wait up, Sean said. There was a man with him. The man wore a tweed sports jacket that held an electronic device. Close up, Philip could see it was a tape recorder. Philip, Sean said, a little out of breath. This is my grandfather's dentist brother. He's a reporter for the Hardingtown Star Tribune. I told him you'd give him an interview. What? Why would you want to interview me? Asked Philip. Don't be modest. You and your lawsuit are big news today, the reporter said. He flipped the switch to his tape recorder. Let's start with background questions. He pushed the microphone in front of Philip's face. Is it true you were born in a circus tent? Excuse me, Philip said. He grabbed Sean by the arm and tugged him away so they could talk privately. What are you doing here? Philip asked Sean. Oh, everybody's here, Sean said. Practically the whole sixth grade. When Mr. Race heard your case was going to trial, he declared it a school field trip. Said it would teach us kids a lesson. He thinks you're going to lose, but me and some of the other kids, we think you got a chance. Are you Philip Stanislaw? An attractive Hispanic woman asked. He's over here, she shouted to a man with a television camera on his shoulder. Aw, no you don't, said the newspaper reporter. I saw him first. While the television reporter and the newspaper reporter argued, Philip fled to an old part of the courthouse and the freight elevator. He took the elevator to the second floor and didn't stop moving until he was in courtroom number two. It was even more crowded inside the courtroom than the lobby. A vast assortment of people filled the spectator seating, packed together like a circus audience on free peanut night. The last rows of seats were filled with sixth graders craning their necks to get a better view of the proceedings. There was a wooden railing that separated the courtroom proper, behind which were a table and chairs on the left, and another set on the right. At the left table, Philip saw a pair of men and women in dark, and a woman in dark suits. At the right table, he saw Sam in an empty chair, which he quickly filled. Sam pointed out the defendant's lawyers, Mr. Dinkle, the boss attorney, and his assistants, Ms. Jones and Mr. Terry. Sam also told Philip that because of the special relief they had sought, a judge instead of a jury would be deciding the case. The good news, said Sam, is that the judge who's been assigned to our case isn't a dodgeball fan. Oh, that is good news, agreed Philip. The bad news is she coaches a recreational soccer team for senior citizens called Golden Toes. Why would that be bad news, asked Philip. Well, it may make her identify more with the defendants and make her lean their way. Will she try to be fair, asked Philip. I think so, said Sam. Philip noticed a pitcher of water on his table and poured them both a tall glass. He also noticed a small trash can next to the table and moved it closer, just in case he had to throw up. Hear ye, hear ye, said the court tip staff, the judge's courtroom helper. All rise for the Honorable Ida E. Mon. And we will stop there right at the beginning of the court case. The judge is entering the room. Philip and Sam are going to have to present their case against the defendant's lawyers, and we'll have to see how this court case plays out and whether or not the judge agrees that a dodgeball is an unreasonably unsafe product and whether or not Philip should be granted his injunction against the game of dodgeball. I hope you'll join us for the next part of the stupendous dodgeball fiasco. Bye.